Hello and welcome to this episode of the REBT Advocates with Dr. Michael R. Edelstein of 3MinuteTherapy.com. You can find his book, 3-Minute Therapy, Change Your Thinking, Change Your Life at the REBT.life. And me, Tommy Bateman, I'm a counselor extraordinaire in the Richmond, Virginia area. Uh, you can contact us both at rebtadvocates at gmail.com. Please send us your request, your hate, and your love, and your questions. We, lo- we love it all, and we want it all. Uh, we want it all. So please do that. Um, today... We have a special guest, and there's Michael. We have a special guest. His name is Ross Grossman, LMFT, is a counselor. I uh, believe he's on the West Coast as well. Uh, he has a, a website. It is procrastinationstoppers.com, and it was the rationalanimal.com as his personal blog. If you just want to get to know Ross better, which you do because he's a great guy, and I'm shaking the camera because I'm so excited about what we're talking about. We're talking about relationships today, but before we get started, Michael, you have something to say? Uh, Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Ross, for joining us once again. Uh, Ross was with us before discussing a client issue. And uh, I'm Dr. Michael Edelstein. I have 40 years experience helping people with REBT, Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy, the subject of all our episodes and podcasts. You can find my practice link below. And my book link, Three Minute Therapy, in the description below as well. So thanks, Ross, Mm -hmm. again, for for joining us. Sure, absolutely. And uh, why don't you tell us the uh, problem your client presented you with that you mentioned to me, and I suggested you come on so the three of us could discuss it. Sure. Uh, Thanks for having me, guys. Great to be here. Um, So my... um, my dilemma for my clients, and this is for more than one client, uh, is that I will occasionally have clients who show up who uh, both uh, male and female or male and male or female and female, uh, and they have so many um, external differences, uh, political differences, religious differences, child rearing practice philosophy differences, dietary differences, uh, familial conflicts with the other person's family, uh, dislike of each other's friends, or maybe not even dislike, but indifference and lack of interest in spending time with the other person's friends. So lots of differences. And these same couples may ask me, is this a desirable relationship? Is, will this endure? Can we make it? And they're trying to decide as to whether or not to either get married or have children or go deeper into the relationship. And um, I'm just very interested in the REBT perspective. I obviously use REBT, but I'd like to hear from you and Tommy how you see this and how you would advise uh, your patients who are in similar situations. I'd like to uh, start with the Yogi Berra perspective, and he says that predictions are difficult, especially about the future. And I'm on board with that. <laughs> it's, uh, it's hard to predict how things will go. And normally the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior. So one issue is how have they been getting along so far? How long have they been seeing each other so far? Are they living together? or just casually dating. So those would be factors for them to consider. Yeah. So I would say, uh, let, let's just say hypothetically, dating for about a year or so, uh, not living together, uh, considering uh, becoming married and uh, living together and having children. Um, uh, and, and, and generally, uh, in general, not having vicious, violent, difficult arguments but more recognizing that they are having differences. Yeah, and how do they feel about these differences? How does the man feel? How does the woman feel? Um, in one particular case, uh, the, the man is more reluctant to move forward and the woman is still saying, we can work all of this out, but the man is the one with a little more rigid uh, criteria for what he will accept in his beloved, in his wife. <clears throat> he is asking the other person to uh, be more restricted in their behavior and more uh, following his lifestyle and his preferences. All right. So as with working on 
most problems, I start with the problem separation technique. And uh, so he's your client, is that correct? Yes. So I would ask, I would ask him, uh, explain the problem separation technique to him, which is that uh, we, he has practical problems here. And that is, uh, is this relationship gonna work? How to make it work? what he what can he do to make it more likely and then the issue is does he have emotional problems about that is he anxious about it not working out is he depressed about the possibility of not working out does he get angry at her or those kinds of things so so that's the first step i would recommend perhaps you've done that already and one of the things i would point out is let's define our terms what does a relationship working out mean um when we're when we're uh defining our goal in this relationship. What does that mean? Well, in this case, it would mean successfully being able to live with one another and raise children together over a long period of time. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. I would imagine 18 years at least. Uh, and, and I will say, yeah, there is a religious aspect to this. One person is more, they, you know, both are in the same religion, but there is one person who believes in following it more rigorously than the other one. Uh, that's a practical problem because if they're in the same home, when you have certain religious restrictions, uh, you don't allow for the other person's uh, looser definition in the same home. So that's a practical problem. Right. And does he have any emotional problems about this? Is he anxious, depressed, resentful, anything like that? Well, the emotional problems are that the, the male feels he won't be able to uh, one of the problems we've been working on is that the person feels so guilty and so rotten uh, if he were to decide not to be with this person who proclaims their love for him. You know, how, how could he possibly do this and not have his very, uh, you know, very small and, and uh, uh, you know, kind of gossipy community not be aware that he left this person who was ostensibly in love with him? Uh huh. Yeah. So, so there, there's there's the dehorrifying him of the idea that he you know that he's an awful terrible person if he decides not to go forward. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, and then another aspect on the practical is uh, deciding how they're going to work on uh, conflicts if it, if they come up. So there are various ways. There are. Uh, conflict resolution strategies. And uh, I normally recommend a book to my clients by John Gottman called Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work. So mm -hmm. I would recommend that they go through that together and do the exercises and uh, see if that helps and see how willing each of them are, are to work on problems. So mm -hmm. uh, that's a very important one. Okay. That sounds good. Yeah. And I, I, will say that I have, you know, we've, we've done cost benefits of staying in this relationship and an alternate list of costs and benefits of leaving the relationships because sometimes we can elicit a slightly different answer. And what I've also offered is let's, let's weight those costs and benefits because sometimes you can list really trivial costs and benefits with very important ones. So I'll have them do a zero to five scale on the importance of each item on their cost benefit analysis, and then see which one is heavily weighted, more heavily weighted than the other, the costs or the benefits. Yeah, um, that's great. That's a great idea. Another uh, thing I normally, I'm sorry, Garros, go on. No, 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 I'm, I'm done with that. Uh, another thing I normally recommend to someone making a decision that's time limited is to consider having a target date that you don't want to go for on forever vacillating mm -hmm. and indecisive about what to do. So, uh, so deciding in three months or one month, two weeks, six months, if I haven't made a decision by then, I'll arbitrarily make a decision, flip a coin, poll my mm -hmm. friends, uh, something along those lines. Okay. Um, do you have, do you speak in any way to, or does Albert Ellis speak to what makes for a desirable, uh, relationship in terms of the basic criteria for when, when 
you know, if, if you're in the early stages, if you're not at this point. Uh, I don't recall exactly uh, or approximately that he's weighed in on that. I imagine he probably has since he's written over 80 books. Some <laughs> of them are on relationships. But normally what makes a good relationship is a good foundation, which consists of unconditional self-acceptance and unconditional other acceptance. So what that means is when you do poorly, and in his case, uh, if he ends the relationship and he feels guilty, he doesn't have unconditional self-acceptance. He's putting himself down. And if he gets angry, resentful, or hostile toward his partner, that's lacking unconditional other acceptance. So that's very important in a good relationship. Let me add to that. Uh, unconditional other acceptance doesn't necessarily mean, and this is for the folks at home, Ross, you know this, yes. doesn't necessarily mean you agree or approve unconditional approval of what they believe or what they do. It's just unconditionally, them, unconditionally accepting them as the flawed human beings that, they're, that they are. It helps uh, maintain your emotions and it's not accepting or, or condoning the things that they do. Yes, and I, I, I remember a particular couple where he had stopped drinking, she hadn't, and he had told her, you know, you can do as you wish, um, but I'm not going to want to be with you if you do as you wish. So I'm, I'm not telling you you're a bad person, but I just, I mean, I accept that that's your decision, but I still may make it my own decision. Uh, so it's not a judgment of you, it's just, this is what I want. Like that. This is what I'm going to do. You this do is what, what I'm going to do. do. I love yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, another thing, yeah. Another thing that uh, it would be useful would be for him to discuss with her whether she'd be interested in couples counseling if things came to a head. Because yes. often just having a third party there in discussions is useful. And then having someone who's skilled in relationship uh, counseling would be even better. And some people are allergic to counseling, so it will be good to find out if she's in that category. That would yes. not be a good sign if, uh, if she said, no, she, we should work out our problems on our own, which I've heard from some people. We'll call yeah. it arbitration, make, you know, instead of counseling. You know, yeah, arbit arbitration, mediation, med yeah. mediation yeah. any of those things. Yeah. Sometimes even with a friend. Negotiation. Uh, yeah, sometimes even with a friend tends to cool things down and allows people to discuss more uh, reasonably different problems. Mm -hmm. And do you uh, have, do either of you have any experience with religious, uh, one person being more religious than the other? Again, guys, the religious part is a uh, practical problem, right? Uh, we have uh, uh, demands of our scripture and our religion, and that's something we have to work with. Um, so how important is it to you? Oh, it's a five out of five. That's something I really got to deal with. Okay, so consult uh, consult your spiritual leader, whatever it is, preacher, rabbi, priest, um, uh, imam. Who is it? Uh, and, no. and give them the situation. Tell them straight up, this is what I got. Okay, and no. then I might go, can't do it, man. I know you love her. Can't do it. And then the decision's made. Right. That's one, that's right. one approach. Yeah, and that's where tolerance comes in also if there are differences it's important that each uh, learn unconditional other acceptance, tolerance of the other person, tolerance of their views. And also the question I think that's important is how, since we have religious differences, how would we raise our children? And in advance, coming to some agreement about that. And again, it doesn't have to be a unilateral agreement because I know a couple where the husband is religious, wife isn't, so, and they have two kids. The husband takes the daughter to church because she's interested in that. The son is not interested. So, uh, and, and they're very tolerant of each other's views. So right. that is an option as well. Yeah. Okay. And, and uh, you know, I, I, when I have couples who aren't religious, mm -hmm. I will go through a values list so that we have a touchstone. Because I do see that for religious couples, uh, their, their text, their religious text is their touchstone, right? Okay, we're in disagreement. Let's go to the book, you know? Yep. Um, so, but, but when they're not religious, 
then, or when one's religious and the other isn't, I try to elicit their values, uh, something I borrowed from uh, ACT. But um, it's, uh, there's like a list of 70 or more values. There's probably hundreds, but uh, 70 core values. And then I see where they overlap. Uh, and then we try to use those like, okay, you're both into compassion or you're both into connection. Is what we're doing right now hitting that value? Is, are we falling short of the value you've both agreed on as your touchstone? Uh, yeah, and, and also with those, sorry, Russ. But I will, I do want to mention one thing, and that is as a therapist. Oh, yeah. Before uh, you go uh, on about values, I just want yeah. to come on that and then go on. And that is when someone says they have particular values, uh, as they say, talk is cheap. So it's good to ask for specific examples where these values were implemented to get a, a better idea of uh, how committed they are to these values. I'm sorry, Ross, you were going yeah. to say. Well, I, as a therapist, I, I struggle at times uh, with my own um, implicit uh, demand, which is I have to help these people make it work. That's a real struggle. I, and, I, and I try to remind myself, but I'd love to hear how you both deal with that is they're coming to me because they want this to work. Right. Albert Ellis wrote an article about that called the neurotic agreement and psychotherapy. And mm. what he's referring to is pretty much what you're saying, Russ. The uh, client thinks they have to get over the problem. And then the therapist thinks he or she has to get the client over the problem. So that's a good thing for you therapists to watch out for that you feel you have to make the relationship work or even more fundamental, you have to get the client over their problems. And uh, as long as you put that pressure on yourself, you're not going to do as good a job. You won't be thinking as clearly and you probably won't enjoy the sessions very much. So that's a very good thing for, for therapists to work on. You don't have to make it work out, either the relationship or the client's emotional disturbance. You never signed the contract saying you would. The contract is you would give them your best and give them the time and then the rest is up to them. So uh, look for your should, look for your must and question, challenge and contradict your musts and shoulds about this. You know, and that's, uh, that's, that's good, Michael. Um, on top of that, I see it as like, I, I start to disputing my preferences. Now I don't have a demand saying I have to get this person, my client where they want to be. I, I have to make them have their goals. Uh, uh, and if they don't have their goals, I'm, I'm a terrible counselor. I like to stay, say I am practical solution neutral. Um, I don't care. And that sounds harsh, but I mean, I'm trying to say, I don't care what the practical solution is. My job as a counselor, as a therapist is to help you with your emotional problem and separate the two. And then we can talk about practical solutions, whether you win, you win or lose, fail or succeed. I'll help you with the emotional fallout in the end, uh, or you'll probably already know how to handle it if you're doing your homework. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I look at it slightly differently, Tommy. Uh, oh, but it overlaps with much use, with much of what you said. I see my job as presenting the best ways the clients can overcome their problem, which means teaching them REBT and some practical mm -hmm. suggestions, and then the rest is up to them. So, uh, so I've done my job, and whether they use what I've taught them in a constructive way or not. It's up to them, and that's that's not my responsibility. I can't uh, force them to use the REBT if they're resistant. And Michael, do you ever have a client say to you, "Hey, you know, you're supposed to help me make this thing work"? No, <laughs> I haven't. But if the client said that, uh, then that that's uh, time to question their supposed tos. Uh, there's no. 11th commandment saying the therapist must make the client better or work things out or things like that. So that's their problem. That's not my problem. If they think I have to make uh, this thing work out and if they're angry, resentful, hostile, anything like that, they have an emotional problem. And it's my job to show them how they can work on that. By the way, in terms of the practical, again, Ross, another thing they can do is what's called trial marriage or living together. Mm -hmm. They could live together, which is a closer approximation of being married. It's not, things change a lot 
when the uh, situation changes from living together to marriage, mm. but this is a closer approximation. And uh, so that might be diagnostic in some ways about whether the relationship would work. Understood. Another thing uh, uh, I think you said, Tommy, was about going to the book and looking at the book if you're religious. So uh, if one of them is religious, what what is he guided by? Is it the uh, uh, Christian Bible or is it the Torah or is it the uh, Quran or something like that? So they could look at that and see if they're on the same page with uh, those uh, admonitions and those recommendations. But there's nothing like living it and uh, seeing how it goes. We can make these predictions and try to diagnose what's going to happen. But the best mm -hmm. thing is to live it. And I actually recommend, uh, which seems a little unusual, I recommend that two people, if they're seriously in a relationship and they want to see if it works out, live together or get married as soon as possible. It's not irrevocable. There is separation and divorce and moving apart and things like that. It's not easy. It's easy for me to say it's not easy for them to do but it certainly uh, would help in terms of uh, being more efficient in diagnosing the the future of a relationship yeah. you know i wanted to add one other thing i do and that is when i do the cost benefit analysis i also ask the person doing it on the costs have you been assertive because sometimes they'll say, well, my partner isn't pleasing me sexually. That, that's the cost of this relationship. And I'll say, well, okay, but that cost may be based on your lack of assertiveness. You didn't necessarily let them know that they were, weren't pleasing you or and how specifically, to Specifically, yeah, how to please you, what you would like. And often the best time to have those sexual discussions is not when you're in the bed and uh, excited in the middle of having sex but at another more uh, calm time to discuss that. So I recommend uh, couples have regularly scheduled relationship discussions on a regular basis. Often they'll do it once a week for 15 or 30 minutes, discuss how the week went in the relationship and what could be improved. And that would definitely be grist for the mill in terms of discussing how sex went, what, what was good for you, what was not good for you, and for me, and how can we improve? I recommend that with finances as well. Weekly family oh, yes. finance oh, meeting, yeah. just sidebar. Oh yeah, yeah, no, I think that's very important. Thanks for bringing that up, Tommy. We didn't even mention finances, but that's another thing that would be really important for them to discuss in advance, yeah. whether they would uh, have a joint account or separate accounts or both, and, and their spending proclivities and habits and those kinds of things. Would one have veto power over the other spending? So there are various uh, um, co uh, permutations and combinations of that, which is important to discuss early in the relationship. Yeah. So that's a good point, Tom. Now, I, I call this the, uh, the gripes and gratitude uh, meeting, you know, and I ask the couples to yeah. start with the gratitude. Right. Uh, I'm, sure, I'm sure you may have both heard of the compliment sandwich. Uh, I ask them to put the meat, the critique inside the bread, which is gratitude. I really appreciate. I really like how you did this and this. And here comes the meat. Um, I'd also like to talk about, you know, this thing I want you to improve on. And, uh, you know, if you can wrap that sandwich up in another compliment, you know, here's what I like about you. So, uh, yeah, I call it a gripe and gratitude so that it's not just uh, just negativity. Yes, yes. I think that's a very good point, Russ. So as we wrap this up, guys, we're running out of time. Zoom's telling us it's, it's, uh, it's over. So uh, what are some final points we want to make? Yeah, Russ, did you have any final points, takeaways, questions, or does this well, give you some things to work with? When you I, I feel really good about this. I think I'm certainly going to uh, be working on my own, uh, and I do consistently, but I want to make it more conscious, my own internal demands as a therapist as to my need, my desperate need to help them work it out. Uh, 
and we'll be working on that. That's my big takeaway. And also, uh, I'll certainly be, rec I've, I've definitely recommended the Gottman book in the past, and I'll be doing that in the future too. Okay, great, great. Okay, thanks for coming on, Ross. I appreciate it. I'm sure this would be very informative for therapists and uh, non-therapists alike. If you, Thank you. You're welcome. If you uh, have any comments about this episode, please put them below. And uh, if you liked the episode, if you thought it was beneficial to you, interesting in any way, please uh, give us a thumbs up and a like. Suggest, suggest subjects for future uh, episodes and feel free to volunteer as Ross did. Looks like Ross survived and the snow is still coming down as it was before. So the world hasn't ended. A donate to Patreon to help support our podcasting and subscribe to the REBT Advocates to stay on the rational side of life.